What's up, everybody? I'm Dr. Garrett Rossi, a board-certified psychiatrist. And if you've ever wanted to know everything about mental health treatment, about psychiatry, then go ahead and click that subscribe button below because it really helps me to know that this information is valuable for you. So today I'm going to be discussing a topic that I've been wanting to cover for a long time. It's a very important topic, and it's more of a medical topic than it is even a psychiatric topic, but we'll get into all those details in a second. And that is, in some cases, people can have a normal thyroid stimulating hormone level and still be depressed. So could thyroid function still be dysfunctional in these cases, even though the TSH and maybe what endocrinology is telling us is all within normal limits. So today's topic is going to be thyroid function in major depression and bipolar depression, and I'm going to explain all those details. So thyroid hormone plays a critical role in the metabolic activity of all cells and in normal development as well. Deficiencies can result in a range of physical and psychiatric effects that are all well established at this point in the medical literature. Now, as a psychiatrist, in some cases, you're going to see patients who are not responding to treatment for depression or bipolar depression, but they will respond much more robustly when augmented with thyroid replacement therapy. Thyroid replacement therapy is a well-established method and augmentation strategy for the treatment of depression. These patients may even have a normal TSH and even a normal T free T3 and T4 levels. So if somebody were to have an abnormal TSH, so this is thyroid stimulating hormone, and this is a common screening test for hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, depending on the clinical picture that's being presented. And if somebody's TSH is abnormal, well, first you might want to recheck the TSH again and be sure that this lab is accurate and this is not a falsely elevated TSH, for example. But let's say that the TSH comes back, it's still elevated, then you might want to get a free T3 and T4 to see whether or not the free thyroid hormone is at appropriate levels or not. But these patients that we're augmenting this medication with are often people who have normal TSH, a normal T3, and a normal T4. So we can see from this diagram that there's great overlap between the symptoms of depression and hypothyroidism, and this is what led to the hypothesis that possibly using thyroid hormone may be helpful as a treatment strategy for depression. So obviously in hypothyroidism, we see things like enlargement of the thyroid gland. We see cold intolerance, brittle hair, loss of eyebrow hair, other issues with thickened and dry skin, low heart rate, cardiac failure, and delayed reflexes. With depression, we can see weight loss, appetite increase, sleep decrease. But in the middle there, we have a whole bunch of things that overlap, right? These are the things that overlap. And that is the dysphoric mood or depressed mood can be the result of hypothyroidism or it could be the result of depression. Loss of interest of pleasure. So loss of interest in pleasurable activities that can also come with hypothyroidism or with depression. Weight gain, appetite decrease, sleep increase, constipation, decreased libido, energia, fatigue, decreased concentration, and suicidal thoughts can all overlap between hypothyroidism and depression. Although it's important to rule out hypothyroidism when evaluating a patient for major depression, in most cases the adjunctive T3 treatment is used in patients who have a normal thyroid function. So these are patients who have normal thyroid function, and we're gonna talk more about what we're looking for in terms of their TSH levels, and why it might not be the case that a normal TSH necessarily indicates an, a proper functioning thyroid. Normal ranges of thyroid hormone, according to lab work, may not be normal in patients with depression. So that's our key point here. Evaluating thyroid function in psychiatry is essential, and as I said before, the first step is going to be to get a TSH. Now, TSH is intended to be a screening test validated for patients with endocrine pathology, right? These are people with endocrinology disorders, not necessarily mental health conditions. And when we think about that, we want to keep in mind that the cutoffs that many of these um, lab, labs are using, and say each lab has a slightly different cutoff, but let's just say the cutoffs that they're using is for a population with endocrine pathology, not necessarily for a population with mental health conditions. 
So these TSH levels that may be appropriate to diagnose hypothyroidism, for example, or abnormal thyroid function in somebody with an endocrine disorder are not the same for those with mental health disorders. Now, psychiatric patients with subclinical hypothyroidism or incomplete response to antidepressants should be treated with thyroid hormones. So if somebody is having an incomplete response to it with antidepressants, you can consider using thyroid hormone. And again, if somebody has subclinical hypothyroidism, meaning they have, say, an elevated TSH, but they have normal T3, T4, you can also treat those patients as well. So that because they're not presenting with clinical symptoms, again, does not mean that it's not affecting the mental health treatment. Now, if the circulating free T3 and T4 are low of normal and the TSH is greater than 2.5, treatment should be initiated. So those are, the, those are the cutoffs that are more standard for mental health treatment. So if you have low circulating T3, T4, and you have a TSH greater than 2.5, treatment should be initiated. Now I would argue that even if the TSH is greater than 2.5, you could consider initiating treatment in somebody who has an inappropriate or lack of response to antidepressants alone. Family history of thyroid dysfunction should also be screened for. And incomplete response to medication for depression should also be considered when deciding whether or not to start somebody on thyroid replacement treatment. So you might be asking a critical question at this point, and that is, why is the cutoff 2.5 for the TSH level in patients with depression? And this actually comes from Harvard's Bruce Cohen, who published an article in the American Journal of Psychiatry in 2018, where he used the cutoff of 2.5 for TSH and said, this is not normal. So if your TSH is 2.5 or above, this is not normal in psychiatric patients. Now, if the patient has antidepressant resistant treatment and a TSH of 2.5, they should be treated to a target TSH of one, according to Cohen. They do not see much risk of treating patients. So like this research did not demonstrate much risk in treating patients with depression to that level. And the most concerning side effect was atrial fibrillation, but it appears to be rare and only occurs when the TSH is driven below 0.1. So this person would have to have a substantial amount of thyroid hormone treatment in order to develop the most feared complication of thyroid replacement treatment, right? So this is where they came up with this idea. And a majority of people in the general population actually have a TSH around 1.5. So what their argument here is, is that because the majority of the population actually has a TSH around 1.5, it doesn't follow your normal distribution, your normal kind of bell-shaped curve, so to speak. And so as you approach 2.5, you are well outside the normal limit of T for the TSH level even for the general population, right? Because majority of the general population has a TSH around 1.5. So it makes sense that you would treat patients with depression or inappropriate response to antidepressant treatment to a TSH around one here because they're, you want to bring them as close to the general population as you can. So 90 to 95% of the population is below 2.5. So if you're 2.5 or above, obviously you're that small percentage of the population. In patients with depression and those who respond poorly to antidepressant treatment and have a TSH level of 2.5 or higher, thyroid hormone replacement may improve response. In many cases, endocrinology will not treat these patients because they only have a slightly elevated TSH and it's not necessarily concerning if they don't have clinical symptoms of hypothyroidism. So a lot of times the, I, the initiation of treatment is gonna to fall to you as the psychiatrist and not necessarily the endocrinologist. So I wanna finish this up by talking about thyroid treatment in bipolar one and bipolar two depression. So the bipolar depression is notoriously hard to treat because we don't really have access to many good medications and because there's always that risk that the person is going to relapse into a manic episode, we have to be very careful what medications we choose and how we use them. But one strategy might be to look at thyroid hormone. So it's thought that people with bipolar disorder have trouble transporting thyroid hormone into their cells. So this is not that they don't have proper levels of thyroid hormone circulating in their blood. It's more so that the thyroid hormone does not get to where it needs to be, right? Which is inside the cells where it can do its job. People with bipolar disorder have low levels of adenosine triphosphate or ATP, right? This is the major energy um, 
energy product for cells, which is required to transport, to actively transport thyroid hormone across the cell membrane. So we have a bipolar patient with low ATP levels, a reduced active transport of thyroid hormone across into the cells, resulting in low thyroid hormone within the cells where it needs to be. Now these individuals may have normal circulating levels, like I said, of thyroid hormone, but they are unable to get it to the proper location where it can exert its physiological actions. The way to overcome this problem would be to provide an excess of thyroid hormone. So you would provide enough of it that you would literally be forcing it inside of the cells to make up for the active transport deficiencies. Now, thyroid hormone treatment in patients with bipolar disorder with rapid cycling does not worsen mania. So this is something that people might be thinking is like, well, if I treat this person with thyroid hormone, will it worsen mania? No, it actually improves rapid cycling in mixed states and doesn't cause mania. There is no evidence that thyroid hormone augmentation will precipitate mania at all. The main side effects to watch out for are increased anxiety, heat intolerance, and increased heart rate. So we want to be mindful of these things, but they're not necessarily major side effects to worry about. When augmenting with thyroid hormone, T3 is actually easier to work with than T4, and that has to do with the half-life of the medication. The half-life of T3 is approximately 24 hours, so steady state would be reached much quicker than with T4. So we would reach it within five half-lives or five days. This makes it easier to titrate, and also for us, it's quicker for us to assess the effectiveness of treat. So I'm going to tell you guys real quick just how we dose T3 in bipolar depression if we're going to use it as an augmentation strategy. So what you're going to do is you're gonna start with 25 micrograms per day and of T3 for one week, and then you're going to increase to 50 micrograms daily. So you're gonna start with 25, you're gonna put the person on it for a week, and then you're gonna increase to 50 MCGs daily. You're going to assess heart rate, you're going to check for heat intolerance, right? All those things that I've mentioned as potential side effects, and you're also going to see what the response is after one week. Now, if the person remains symptomatic at 50 micrograms, rather, so you're going to increase then to 75. So you're gonna add another 25 to 75 MCGs, and you're going to titrate to a target dose of 150 micrograms daily. That's going to be your target dose. If there is no response after four weeks at 150 micrograms, you're gonna to wanna to consider stopping treatment at that point because it doesn't seem to be effective. But this is a strategy that is often underutilized and one that may be very beneficial for the very difficult treatment of bipolar depression. So with that said, I'm gonna hold the video there, guys. If you have any questions or comments, I would love to see them below. And please consider subscribing to the channel. It really helps me to keep making these videos.